Hello, everybody. I'm John Murphy. You're watching on the home front. We're very happy to have some time with you today. Our programs are live on WILI AM 1400 and 95.3 on the digital FM, but also we're videotaped for the radio station's YouTube channel for 24 seven access to help our guests get their stories out in as many ways as possible. So we're very happy to have you with us. We're also rebroadcast on WECS, the uh, station at Eastern Connecticut State University. So today we're gonna continue our focus on journalism and the news industry in Connecticut. And this will be the third in our series, looking at newspapers and radio and TV and digital media and how the industry's uh, making it through a hard time and how people are in the middle of a great change in their relationship to news. And some people are forgetting how important it is to their daily lives. And we're trying to look at the industry and how it's trying to adapt to all these changes and keep growing. And we have three people today. I'm very happy to share our time for the whole show. Uh, if, you, if you're watching uh, from left to right, my first guest today, I'm very happy to have Neil Ostrout here today. He's the managing editor at the Journal Enquirer, uh, based in Manchester, serving North Central Connecticut. Uh, great to have you here, Neil. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Also, next to Neil, we have Matt Dwyer from Connecticut Public Radio, Connecticut Public in Hartford. He is the midday news anchor. And he's also the producer of a great series, Where We Live. He's been with them now for three years. And before that, he was doing serious radio, WTICAM, for 18 years. So you got a radio guy here. Matt, thank you very much for being here today. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to have you, indeed. And next to me, we have uh, Todd Charlin, the general manager. He's uh, the regional circulation director at The Chronicle and their related publications. He's right here in town, so he's our local paper, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So one thing we could do maybe to start us, uh, so we'll go halfway through the show, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and finish, but maybe a good beginning is to talk about the industry and how it was doing before COVID, because everybody is pretty aware these days of how COVID has impacted the arts and culture and business. But before COVID, journalism was really struggling. And these folks and these organizations were already trying to adapt to many changes. So maybe what you could do, and then perhaps you could start out, Neil, is uh, going back three or four years, what was your biggest challenge? And how are you making it through all these changing audiences and technology deliveries and labor issues with getting workers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah. <clears throat> it's maybe a little too easy to say that in my business that newspaper readers skew older. I mean, that's generally true, of course. But I think it's a way, the way people get news has changed, obviously, greatly in the last you know, 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, you know, local news suffers because a lot of people are – you're not seeking out news based on your region. A lot of people are seeking out news based on their political persuasion or general feelings. So you're seeking out – news organizations that, that have your slant. And that's a, l a major change from the old days where you would, even, even in a big city that had two newspapers, you know, you're still getting your local news from your local area. Now, obviously, you know, internet and cable TV have changed things dramatically, and that was a lot, a lot uh, longer ago than three years, but it's, yeah. it's slowly changed more and more each year. And that, you know, between getting your news from from Fox News instead of your local Fox affiliate is is, is the big difference and it's it's not necessarily uh, you know that you don't appreciate local news it's and a lot of times you're imbibing local news without even realizing it like you know a, a, a newspaper story gets posted on Facebook or Twitter you say well I get my news from Facebook or Twitter well not exactly <laughs> you're still getting it from the local journalist and I don't know if there's a realization of that in, amongst the general public sometimes so there's a Obviously, the, the, the biggest challenges that I've seen, and COVID aside, obviously, a lot of, uh, you know, different businesses were hurt by COVID and sure. newspapers, radio stations, you know, local journalism was hurt as much as any. But yeah. obviously, it, things were trending in a slightly negative direction before that. You yeah. know, those are great points. And one thing that I noticed in your remarks was that people's idea of what news is, is different. Mm. There used to be a much more centralized focus on, you know, well, what is our shared truth? Uh, there's only a few places to get it, and we kind of trust it a little bit to be fair and accurate. Well, now, with so many people being able to do their own thing because technology lets them, the labels are critical. What's opinion? What's fact, right? And social media has taken a big toll on that. Oh, yeah. We've too, you know? Oh, yeah. A lot of people are going to Facebook and Instagram, all these other sure. sources to to look at news, and then they believe that to be true all the time. That's right. And there's a lot of things that are reported wrong on there. Um, and then the stories get totally 
is represented. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like the, the nice thing about social media is anybody can be on there, but the drawback to social media is anybody yeah. can be on there. <laughs> yep. And I, I know personally, Snipes, it, it's almost kind of hard to tell a little bit, you know, when you're, you're reading a tweet or some sort of, you know, social media post or, or whatever. It, it can be hard to tell it, kind of how, how legit the person writing that is you know you don't you don't get the if you meet somebody in person right you know, if they're drunk you know you you can tell <laughs> you know if they're a little, a little off you can tell you know yeah. if somebody write, writes a letter by hand you can tell or, or you know in the olden days types up a letter or prints it out and mails it or something whereas mm-hmm. social media i think kind of flattens all of the opinions a little bit it makes it a little bit more difficult to tell kind of gives a wall to hide behind too for, for people. yeah, yeah. That's, sure. that's very tactfully put <laughs> Very tough. Because the thing is, for some news organizations, if they have enough staffing, you control social media for leads sometimes. Something's happening locally and you can't get a reporter everywhere. It's very hard these days. Those nooks and crannies can be really interesting stories. But you have to wade through all the flotsam and jetsam, right? Absolutely. That's, yeah. It's just, I mean, certainly at, at, at work, I use, you know, Twitter feeds and other social media to partly to look and see what other reporters are doing and partly to see what other organizations are, are you know, what messages or information they're putting out and what people are just talking about. Yeah. Um, but it, it reinforces the importance of, like, double-checking that information and, <laughs> you know, making the phone call and, or going to a more reliable source to make sure, okay, is this really real? And, I mean, for, for me and for us, that's just sort of part of our job. For an average person at home, it's it's a little more tricky because they don't necessarily. It's not their job. They don't have the time to look everything up. And, That's right. You know, sometimes if something gets repeated enough in social media, it just sort of gets in somebody's brain. And, it's like advertising you know, in a different way. Yep. Yeah. So Matt, let me ask you while we have you there because you're the most heavily radio guy. Uh, you know, I should say too, Matt and I had done radio together up at the Yukon radio station for many years, so we've shared the airwaves together. So it's really sweet to have you here in the house. But on the radio end, before COVID, how are you dealing with these changes in audiences and their phones and pledging and grant uh, from uh, CPB and local underwriting? How are you making it through all these changes on the radio side? Well, I mean, certainly. So, so before I started working at uh, Connecticut Public Radio, I was working at WTICAM. Right. Um, the difference between the two is TICAM is, is a, or one of the differences is TICAM is like a commercial station. Yes. Uh, so much like the, the newspapers and stuff, they rely on advertising. Um, and I think for radio and newspapers and TV, you know, the, the long-term trend has been down, both in terms of, of advertising revenue and in terms of, of news staff. Uh, and I believe that's probably, I mean, it has hit all of them, including radio, but I think it's probably hit newspapers the hardest in terms of reduced staff. Um, but, I mean, I, it, you know, and at TIC, we sort of saw some of that where they're, you know, over time, the staff gradually got smaller. And I think that's, you know, an industry-wide trend yeah. in, in reporting. Right. Um, uh, unfortunately, that sometimes, you know, impacts the, the product and, and the quality of the news that people are getting. If you, you know, you can't have a reporter at the meeting that's going on because the reporter is somewhere else or, the, you know. That's right. There are only there are fewer things that you can cover in a, in a given day if you have fewer people to send out, unfortunately. So it, it's yeah. not been good in that sense. And, you know, that's the coverage gap. I mean, the news hole is getting deep because people still need to know things. Things move on whether you know them or not. True. Whether you make the meeting, they vote, they spend the money, they approve projects. So when journalism's not there, the citizen loses really valuable stuff. And one of the things I wanted to do today while we have our conversation, is to not forget you. Because what's happening today is a lot of people are taking journalism for granted. They don't see how much that depends on your freedom, uh, who you vote for, whatever your party, how well is that party doing, what are the laws to make communication more honest. And journalism has been the path, remember? That's our colonial freedom from the Brits. It was newspapers and journalism. And something I, I, I came across today, 100 years ago, We had 500 cities in this country with two daily papers. I'll say that again. A hundred years ago, we had 500 cities in the U.S. with two daily papers. Now there's less than 12. I believe less than 12. So it's contracted. And I wondered in the background, as you're figuring out long-term plans, audience growth, how do you fight against that tide, not of people getting their news elsewhere, but people forgetting what news is really all about? And it's not entertainment. Yeah, it's it's a challenge because I think there are some positives to 
you know, the 24 seven aspect of news gathering these days. I think your average citizen knows a lot more about the inner workings of the U S Congress and the presidency and the Supreme court maybe than they ever did. And that's great. And that's a sure. positive. And, um, it's wonderful that we all have access to that. But I think your average citizen knows a thousand times less about their local school board meeting and their local, you know, town council meeting than they ever did. I mean, local journalism is, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit biased, but it's vitally important. Sure. And there's just way too many what they call news deserts these days. I, for instance, I live in Colchester. And, you know, in the historically, the Norwich Bulletin would cover Colchester a little bit. The London Day would cover Colchester. The Hartford Current would come down and cover Colchester. Right. Now, none of those daily newspapers cover the town anymore. And it, it leads to a lot of problems. And that's that's... You know, the same for a million towns across the country. It is. And they're, you know, it's it's a cliche, but local journalism has to be a watchdog and has to be attentive to a town's needs. And there's just too many of those spots around the country that don't get attention. And that can cause, you know, numerous problems. I mean, corruption is, is the one you, you think of, but sure. it's, it's, it's a lot more than that. You know, and your, your average yeah. citizen these days is not attuned to that anymore. That's I true. Think that contributes to people forgetting how important local news is. Yeah. Because when you can't cover those areas, where do they go? They go to other sources, and they kind of lose that local paper feel. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's very important to Absolutely. keep those covered. I agree Ult with that. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, voters need good independent sources of information to, yeah. that are reliable to decide who to vote for. You know, and mm -hmm. that, that's uh, that's one of the primary missions for local news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the other side of the coin is when you have a vacuum, it's open for exploitation. People will become players in lies, and they will carefully write things to avoid libel suits or, alleged, or, or problems. But they'll inject things into our communications that manipulate how people say yes or no, or I'll spend the money or I won't. And since so many local things are getting stressed now, Part of this is the lack of people to just figure it out for themselves, right? Uh, well, let's keep our, our conversation going over to our local paper here in town, a historic paper, family run until recently, changed hands in the last several years. And I wonder, Todd, how are things maybe three or four years ago, and how, how is the paper handling the same kind of challenges here? So Wayne? there's a lot, of, a lot of change. You know, there was change before COVID, um, like we talked about earlier. Sure. Um, and, and there's change afterwards. Um, you know, some of the biggest things that we've, we've done is um, we have built up our social media presence more. And we've been waiting 10 years to get a new website. We finally got it launched a week and a half ago. Congratulations. Yes, so I invite That's everyone awesome. to go look at the new Chronicle.com. The Chronicle.com. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, it's you know it's got a way of a kind of rebranding ourselves, getting out there, getting that news, um, and you know with the changes, one of the biggest things you're talking about um, getting people to work is we're having trouble getting carriers and good carriers. Um, so as that pool yeah, of too. people were going down, we are loading up more people, which caused you know cars breaking down. Then managers were out, um, general managers publishers were out delivering you know anyone wow. we could get that could grab a paper and get on the road was out there um so we last year made the big decision to go to the mail right and so now our papers are being mailed so we can get them into the hands of the customers what was the feedback after the initial confusion did people understand and they're they're more comfortable now is it is kind of yeah yeah and there? of course there was mixed you know yeah. um, mixed feelings and, you know new britain and bristol our papers down there were morning papers so now they're getting them some people are getting them at three o'clock four o'clock five o'clock mm -hmm. but as we explained to them it's the same local news but they right. got it first thing in the morning or the afternoon you're getting the true local news that you're not going to get from your other sources yeah yeah well i'll tell you what we'll do i think we're coming up on the halfway point of the show so we'll take a break for a couple of messages and then we'll come back and continue our conversation with our guests about journalism and the news industry in Connecticut. Stay with us. Okay, we're back again live here for the program on the home front. John Murphy, very happy to share some time with you today. This is the second part of our program this week, and it's the third in our series about journalism in Connecticut and the state of the industry. I just want to mention our guests again in case you've joined us or if you're on the radio. To my far right, on your left, we have Neil Ostrout with us today. He's the managing editor at the Journal Inquirer of, from Manchester. Uh, next to Neil, we have Matt Dwyer from Connecticut Public. 
National Public Radio in Hartford. Matt is the midday news anchor, and he's the producer of Where We Live, a great show in the mornings. And next to me, we have uh, Todd Charlin, the general manager and the regional circulation director at the Chronicle here in town. So once again, I want to thank you for sharing these stories today. And one thing that we thought that we would share with our audience is how the ownership changes in the industry are affecting your freedom and your uh, range of resources that are available to do the job. Because depending on who the boss is, if the goal is only to generate revenue as a unit in a larger entity, then news isn't the priority anymore the way it used to be. And the fact that you have new kinds of owners has created many challenges to people that want to do the right job. So can you talk a little bit about how this idea of vulture investing or other owners that are conglomerates that buy units because they want to have a little piece of everything? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a little bit lucky in Manchester that we are one of the rare family-owned newspapers and, and still surviving uh, that way. And I don't want to make it sound like all oh, corporate ownership of newspapers are terrible. Of course not. There are some very good media companies who have the interests of readers in mind, and, you know, mm -hmm. there are some terrific ones. But, I mean, things that have happened to major newspapers in Chicago, Los Angeles, and a little bit to our friends in Hartford, uh, who, you know, far be it for me to take shots at anyone locally. They're terrific people. But, you know, they've been hurt. And it's, it's yeah. when, you, when you gut staffs by, you know, you know 80 percent you know it's it's hard to put out the, the anything close to the same product that you used to and you know it's it's the bottom line is important in all businesses but in journalism it can't it can't be the only goal and that's that's the that's the rub that's the difficulty it's it's an industry that is can be profitable i think on almost any level there are ways to make it profitable but when extreme profits are the goal you know your your journalism suffers and that's just the way it is I think in, in Connecticut, I think the sort of the, the change in the current over the years, the Hartford Current, has, has been yeah. a, a pretty major one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, going back you know, to the, the early 2000s, I mean, the current sort of was the, the dominant sort of news organization and sure. newspaper in, in the state. And they tended to, to break a lot of stories, that a lot more stories than, than other newspapers. Yeah. Um, their staff was a lot bigger back then. Um, and I, believe a couple of hundred people you know sort of that era i think they're down to just like a sort of a few dozen now yeah um i believe the current newsroom was 200 in the mid 90s something like that it was very yeah. likely and yeah. they had zoned editions yep so you had eastern southern so you had a whole section just for your local stuff mm -hmm. yeah and sort of, I mean, working at WTIC and, and not exactly competing, but covering the same stories as they were, you could sort of see the, the difference over the years where, you know, 20 years ago, you know, the current would have, you know, if there was a, a press conference, they would be reporting what was going to be announced the day before, <laughs> yeah. you know, and yeah. they just don't have enough people to do that anymore. Um, and uh, I think maybe some of the sort of enterprise or investigative kind of stuff suffers a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, I'm picking on the current, but I think that's something that, that kind of has hit, you know, all the news organizations in the state. And um, many <laughs> cities of the same size are having the same problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with us having the change of ownership last year in yeah. April. Um, so it's still, you know, it's Southern Connecticut, I mean, Southern Rhode Island newspapers right. that, that purchased us. And they have, you know, over 10 papers out there, dailies and weeklies. They focus on the local. For us, it was actually a good thing. Um, they help us, like I said, they got us up this website. We got new, uh, you know, programs. Um, so we're using new software. That's great. So it's actually, they're investing in us to make us a better local paper to to build right. this back up. Um, so, and as you said, you know, it, it's been going a certain way for a long time, and we got to try to right that ship and bring it back That's right. to where it used to be. Mm -hmm. And since everything is going digital in some form, having a good website is now essential. Yeah. It's not like an extra thing if you can have it. It's like, yeah. well, it's part of the transmission of the car, you yep. know. Mm. Exactly. Uh, something you mentioned, uh, Neil, I wanted to say is that these folks started in the late 60s, and they merged two smaller papers came into a larger one. One was in East Windsor and South Windsor and Rockville. Mm -hmm. So those areas kind of grew enough to consolidate, which was interesting. Uh, could you talk about that and how they formed a bigger family together? And also, how is it for you to be an afternoon paper versus a morning paper? Yeah, we are a bit of a dinosaur in that yeah. way. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, still an afternoon daily. Uh, no, yeah, the... Uh, 
the Ellis is Betty Ellis, uh, who recently who passed away a couple years ago, and her husband Neil Ellis uh, started the Journal Enquirer, merging the two papers, right. and uh, yeah, and it, it grew quickly. I w- when I was a, a lad, I delivered the paper uh, in the wow. Enfield area, and uh, uh, I remember uh, joking with Randy Smith, the longtime columnist, sports columnist at the Journal Enquirer. Years later, I said, you know, you're a pretty good writer, but I used to carry you in my bag, you know, so you know. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, obviously we're, we're a little bit unique in that um, our uh, production is done in the morning still and delivery in the afternoon, uh, which again was maybe 40% of the newspapers nationwide and, you know, 100 years ago, and now it's maybe 2%. I don't know. There's not, there's not too many left. Um, we're holding out. <laughs> Who's, no, no, nothing can says it won't change at some point. Right. But uh, it's it's still, I think, pretty welcome in our area, and there are people who rely on it and... Obviously, that readership skews a little bit older, but yes. that's not, uh, you know, 100%. And we're try- always trying to engage younger readers and, and get people back into newspapers. Well, you know, that's a good transition to something I was going to ask about, which is employment in the field today. Because when papers try to reach younger audiences, they have to go where they are to bring them back. So they need to have digital presence so that somebody who's cruising the web could discover them and then come over to get everything else, right? So are these where new opportunities are for young people to find work? Because you need workers. Every industry needs that supply of new talent. And I just wondered how that works when the old model is adapting. You have to reach out, but you still want to keep the paper the way it is. You just want more people to come over. Yeah. Is this where people can find opportunities, or how can people prepare for work today in the field? Yeah, journalism is, is storytelling at its heart, and it's 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 news gathering, and it's if if you want to succeed in this field, you just learn how to talk to people. I mean, that's one of the biggest skills you can learn. I wish everyone could write perfectly, and that would be terrific. But we have some solid copy editors that can help you there too. Right. Um, but no, uh, you know. Journalism, communications, it's about talking to people, it's about finding stories, and I think that's going to be a universal, you know, at, at any time, in any age. And young people trying to get into a business like this, radio, TV, newspapers, anything like that, listen a lot, listen to what people say, become a good listener and a good storyteller, and that, that, that'll take you a long way. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, skills like being able to, to understand complicated things and explain them simply and mm-hmm. telling the truth and, and stuff like that kind of, you know, transcend journalism and apply in other, other fields as well. Um, I know at, at, at our place, I mean, we, because we're, we're a nonprofit, we have, you know, some of our staff are, are grant funded. So some of them kind of come in for, you know, a few years and then the grant runs out and, mm-hmm. and they move on. Um, so we do have sort of some, some, Turnover with some of the some of the younger staffers that way, unfortunately. Um, but it, I mean, they're still finding jobs even after they leave journalism. You know, going mm-hmm. into in our case, some of them going to work for nonprofits or going into public relations or or going to other little projects that are, are sort of more independent uh, for for audio production. You know, I mean, we talked about social media before, but you know, right. podcasting is a thing yeah. out there, and there yeah. are you know other options and and you know, I guess maybe an upside to to social media and the internet is maybe you don't necessarily need a, a giant transmitter like WILI has, uh, right? Um, you know, Hello, you, Canada. <laughs> right, yeah. How is it up there? Uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you can sort of, rec- you know, audio, for example, you can, can, you know, with not too much expensive equipment, you can record a pretty professional sounding thing. And, That's you know, right. if you're, you're writing, you can, you know, just need a computer, you know, yeah, and interview yeah, sure. some people. So, you know, in that sense, I think it does sort of open up mm-hmm. the, the, the newer technology, you know, maybe independent of journalism organizations, maybe, maybe opens up some opportunities mm-hmm. for people. Yeah. And hope. maybe one, I'm sorry, go ahead. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> maybe one other angle on this without taking too much time is through a university or a school trying to provide training. Uh, internships is a different kind of thing than employment. Could you talk a bit about where internships might be a path? Yeah, I think they're vital. I think ex- you know, getting getting real world experience. Use right. the old cliche, but no, to to know the inner workings of a place. I mean, it worked. It was maybe a year ago or twenty some years ago. But when I interned at the Willamette Chronicle, it was a highly successful venture, and I learned a ton. I learned, you know. I'd already had a good idea on deadlines and, you know, writing and working for an editor and things like that. But 
doing it in a professional setting, you know, learning from people who do it daily was invaluable. And that, that personally, that really got me started on the right way. So I, I think that still applies to this day. I think anyone looking to break into this, apply for internships. And, you know, I used to say, um, uh, you know, go to the smaller paper because, you know, at a big paper, you can get lost. Well, all the papers are small now. So go to, <laughs> go to any paper and, uh, and get some real world experience. It helps a lot. Absolutely. And I, I think that, that that helps also to, you know, if somebody's looking for a job in, in journalism to, you know, have clips or have stories they've actually done, yep. um, you know, that, that, that helps to be able to, to show to the, the person who's, who's doing the hiring. Well, let me ask this now, uh, as public radio, this is a national network of stations uh, connected by satellite and web, of course. But they each have a mix of national programming and local. And I wondered, when you try to do your scheduling, how do you juggle how much of each based on the staffing you have and people that are available versus what you might like to do? And what's out there on the satellite that people may not know? You have so many choices. Yeah, you know, part of part of what I work on um, at Connecticut Public Radio is is all things considered, which is a, a national show. Oh yeah, um, flagship. Yeah, um, and it, in in that case, I mean, uh, we have these sort of local news breaks in there, and and sometimes we kind of struggle with that, where the national programming is programming is 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 very good. I don't want to toot my own term <laughs> too much, but we're great. Uh, but the national programming is very good. And and a lot of people listen for that, you know, because they enjoy it. Sure. And sometimes it's sort of like we it's it can be a struggle to get local stuff that is up to that standard. Um, and so that's kind of like I, I think our, our challenge is to make the local stuff as good as the national stuff, you mm -hmm. know, so that people enjoy it as much and get as much out of it and get right. as informed. Um, I mean, I, I think that I think we we do pretty well in terms of producing local talk shows where we have, you know, uh, the, the Colin McEnroe show. And, Absolutely. And, and where we live, Lucy you know, show. an hour a day, five days a week. Yeah. And then um, also several other shows like Audacious um, that are on once a week that kind of repeat a couple of times, but that bring some, some interesting perspectives to things. Um, so, you know, we do have several local shows that are, are out there also. All right. Uh, and it's ctpublic.org. Right. Yep. Ctpublic.org. Now, how about the national stuff? Now, apart from your local shows, for every hour you have that you air, there's lots of stuff floating up there. What's that marketplace like these days? Or, or are a lot of those shows becoming podcasts elsewhere? What's that happening? Um, well, I mean, there's we have quite a few, like I said, other other shows on during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think most of the shows that we air are still sort of in the the sort of NPR universe. Um, we're, we're not airing too many things that are like just podcasts or anything. Right, right. Um, but that being said, I mean, some of our, certainly our, our local shows, you know, also exist as podcasts as well. Um, so well, they then they can enjoy the show later if they miss it. Yep. Exactly. It's available another time, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, we sort of like to push things out that way. Um, we, I know they're actually doing some work on some of the apps that we're involved in right now. Connecticut Public, we have our own app, and then there's like a couple of NPR apps, which are slowly being combined now. There's there's NPR mm -hmm. One, and then there's, there's the NPR app. App Wars. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but they're still out there. And so <clears throat> so those, those two apps, those national apps are being combined. Yeah. And if you have those, sometimes we'll actually put some of our local content in those apps as well. Um, certainly in our own app, you'll see a lot of our stories and stuff. Right. And, and those are on our website as well. Um, and in the, the national app, I believe it's NPR One is combining with um, the NPR app and that'll be, it'll be magical. <laughs> Trust me. Well, they're just trying to make it as easy as possible for you to be confused and eventually find exactly what you want. Right. It's, it's, it's bliss. Uh, speaking of bliss, one thing I want to ask these gentlemen is a little personal stuff. Because one thing I love to talk to artists about is their original path and what made them choose this path versus another one. So for you guys... When you were younger, how did you first connect to the idea of what news is? Because we were talking about before, well, what is the news, right? What made you connect to it? And how did you find your way kind of to the kind of work you're doing today? Just uh, kind of in reverse. Yeah. Uh, my uh, first discovery of uh, maybe mass media was looking in baseball box scores to see how many uh, RBIs Dave Winfield had the night before in the okay. morning paper. 
And so I was a big sports fan when I was a kid, and I wanted to get into something to do with sports. And when I got to the University of Connecticut, along with some other talented people back in the day, um, I wanted to try journalism. And uh, maybe one journalism class and 10 minutes at the student newspaper, and I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I did my best to get in where I could and make some noise and do what I liked, and I've been doing it every day since. Did you get to meet Evan Hill? Evan Hill, I do know the name. Yeah, he was one of the founders. He was the he was probably the best known head of the journalism department for decades. Mm-hmm. Maureen Crodo was uh, she followed after him. He's an interesting guy. Yeah, tough as nails, mm-hmm. journalist, but inspired many students to follow the path. Yeah, yeah. John, right. John Maureen Crodo. I mean Maureen Crodo, John yeah. Green, uh, Marcel Dufresne. Uh, mm-hmm. Terrific, terrific uh, professors at UConn in my yeah. time. So Matt, how about your uh, your path? Well, I guess maybe the comics were sort of the thing, the, the comics in the newspaper, maybe the first thing that, that sort of my, my entryway to, to journalism when I was a kid. Um, and, and I took a journalism class in, in high school and sort of found that, like, I enjoyed, you know, all the things that, that journalists do, uh, writing, taking pictures, you know, drawing comics, right. um, you know, all that stuff. And, and, and I'm sort of curious about what's going on. What kind like, of funny. comics were you like? Is it like Sad Sack or was it Zippy the Pinhead? <laughs> Just, yeah, it's, it's every everything in the in the Hartford Current at the time. It's so, the whole rainbow. Know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very nice. Yeah. yeah. And Todd, how about yourself? So uh, the paper was delivered to the house every day when I was a kid. There you go. So And I like sports, so that's where I go mm-hmm. to get it. Um, mm-hmm. But how I kind of took this path was um, I actually started delivering the newspaper. On a regular basis, right? You uh, make that, a yeah. little extra money mm-hmm. um, when I had some kids, so uh, I had to make a little extra money, and I enjoyed it. And I used to read the paper every day. So an opportunity actually at uh, um, Norris Bolton opened up, nice. and I started down there as a dis- uh, district manager, and just kept, kept doing plugging that. away. Right on. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah. Well, you're getting an idea that with the industry changes today, one thing that's good, I think, apart from all the Uh, confusion people are facing is technically if you have a certain set of skills there are more places than ever that are looking to communicate so whether it's a traditional news channel uh, a large social action agency anybody working for any kind of change they've transformed what they used to call PR or public service into an ongoing media enterprise and they're hiring people or bringing people in even if it isn't a full-time job But they need video producers, they need writers, because they know that the press is limited today. You've heard these guys talk about how much more they could do, and they do the best with what they have. But those stories don't go away. Uh, Those social agencies still have to let you know where your tax dollars go and who's really being served. And if you don't know those people, you may not think anything about that money anymore. Uh, So without getting on a soapbox, can you talk about that dynamic of how readers and subscribers that pay a little bit, fuel this. And that comes back to them in a better community. Absolutely. I mean, you know... It seems simple, but it's kind of forgotten. It's a bit of a lost art. No, certainly. I mean, I I think, you know, listening to local radio, reading your local newspaper, um, this is the, the key to use the cliche making your tax dollars work <laughs> and, and watching yeah. and watching the pennies and yeah. you know the the amount of money that you spend to subscribe to a newspaper or uh you know and to find your local news will be paid back to you tenfold you know if if you pay attention to it and i think that's you know the again i go back to the old the watchdog nature of journalism is is so necessary and yes yeah. Again, it, it could it could literally put put zeros on the end of your disposable income uh, in the long run. Yeah, I think I feel a pledge drive coming on. <laughs> Support public radio. Go to your computer right now. Click on the red donate now button or call one eight hundred. If I get a tote bag, I'm in. Okay. All right. Yes. Fine. Thank you. But you know that's why Matt was news director at WHUS at UConn because he had that kind of power. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And that and for for so for for public uh, media, that's kind of part of our business model, I guess, is that you know we, we produce the content and then ask people to give us money to to produce more of it um, in the hopes that they they value it and get something out of it and and want to support it and it's, it's 
pretty much working so far. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, you in know. spite of it all, right? Yep. And, you know, one thing I'm going to try to do in a future program is talk to some of the news organizations in other parts of the country that are finding other models like municipal supported newspapers where taxpayers have said, our local newspaper is like a utility. It's like water. It's like electricity. So tax revenues are voted and they're used to help subsidize their local paper. Otherwise, they're in a news desert. They're experimenting now because people realize things are not good. They can argue about how they got that way, but that won't fix it anymore. So what they can do is find new ways to pay for it. And this is kind of where you're struggling. Online, it's so great to know that your new owners are investing in the website. Because when you're local, that's everything now. Yeah. And that will fuel it over time, right? Exactly. So each one of these guys has different kinds of jobs. There's a circulation manager, a general manager, and an anchor, a kind of a reporter midday. What's the best part of the job that keeps you there in the middle of the other stuff? And what's the hardest part of the job? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, just sort of the, the, the writing. Um, and like I said earlier, just the, the, the same stuff I was talking about as to why I got involved. You know, I, I enjoy finding things out, and I like writing and explaining things. And I think hopefully I'm providing some, some use for somebody out there who's listening. Um, and, and also to – oh, and, and the, the difficult part, I think, also – for me and, and for, for a lot of journalists, it's just sort of the, the time pressures that you're under. You know, if I'm doing oh, a newscast yeah. every hour, oh, um, my so you sort of have to turn things around very quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and to play off of one thing you mentioned a moment earlier uh, about sort of some of the business models as well, um, I just wanted to mention the, the Connecticut Mirror, which is actually in the, the same yep. building that we're in, kind of downstairs from us. Yes. Um, very interesting in that they're, you know, nonprofit and doing sort of you know, text or print journalism online, and, and I think being very successful at it. Many former uh, Journal Inquirer uh, scribes there who do excellent work, just saying. <laughs> yes. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that, because our very first journalism <clears throat> show several weeks ago when we began the series had Bruce Parterman from the Connecticut Mirror. He's the publisher. We also had uh, Karen Florin from The Day. She was their engagement editor. And Tom King, a publisher of Neighbors, a monthly regional magazine. Uh... So we have just a few moments to go, but I wanted to ask a little bit more about the different aspects of running your papers. Uh, different departments, people know sports, mm -hmm. but how do you decide on what other content to include apart from hard news stories? Because people look to their paper for lots of reasons, mm -hmm. and that's part of the fun, right, is that recipe. Mm -hmm. So how do you put that together each day? What kind of sources do you draw on that people may not realize where it comes from? Yeah, well, we just started a new little thing. It's been kind of fun, uh, kind of a consumer watchdog type thing. We started it with, um, you know, gas prices when they went crazy. Oh, you boy. know, so just do it. send a photographer out, getting a sample of, of gas prices in the area, you know, looking at national averages. And then that kind of s sprung into, oh, eggs were $9 a dozen, <laughs> yes. you know, a month ago. You sure. know, trying to get lo get to local markets without embarrassing different, you know, overchargers and, and uh, you know, places like that. But... Um, that's, our, that's our features department in, in our newspaper, and they're great. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting things beyond hard news and, and sports. Um, we do a great, I mean, restaurant views are great, theater reviews, things like right. that. I love reading that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I in, imbibe as much hard news as the next person, but I, yeah. I love kind of uh, slice of life type things, personalities and, and different stories that way. I know a lot of that ties to everyday life that makes it interesting week to week. Right. Yeah. Uh, and how about and yourself? I think, here? Yeah. I think the uh, community telling us about some of those items helps a lot. You know, if you know something that's going on or coming up or something that you might be interested in, yeah, send us an email, send a letter to the editor or mm -hmm. an email to the editor, or uh, let us know about it so we can get somebody out there. And if we can't, sometimes we can get content from somebody that's there. Um, maybe a basketball game we can't get to, but you might take some pictures for us and send it to us. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that as well. Yeah. I don't know, for Connecticut Public Radio, and the arts coverage has already always been sort of one of mm -hmm. our, our strengths. Mm -hmm. um, I think partly because of our, our history for a long time, we were sort of a classical music station that's true. for a lot of the day. Um, and that some of that has, has kind of continued with a, a focus on, on arts coverage. Yeah, that's true. Uh, or on the TV side, there's a whole audience very dedicated to the BBC. They're fanatical about it. And they support it, so it's there for them as well. 
Uh, well, anyway, Matthew gave a true confession of the hardest part of his job, but you guys are still <laughs> avoiding that one. You're avoiding it. True confessions. We have a few minutes left. Well, the hardest I mean, part. Hardest part yeah. is, um, yeah. I mean, just going through the daily grind of letting letting subscribers know how important we are in the different aspects of, of our industry and the changes that are coming on. Um, you know, we did have to get through the whole being an afternoon paper for the Chronicle and a morning paper for, for New Britain and Bristol and changing that into the mail. Right. Um, and right. that was a big thing to work through. Sure. Um, you know, and educating people why we made that choice. It takes time, too. Yeah. Yep. And, um, I mean, it's been successful, but it's it's been a, a tough go. Yeah. Um, so it's just getting out there and letting people know that we're here and how important we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the great news is having put them together through distribution, the website can serve them both exactly. in an enhanced way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. good news, actually. Yeah. yeah the, Please. The yeah. hardest part for me is, is, is trying to live up to the standards of my predecessors and just doing the best job journalistically you can with an increasingly shrinking staff and budget. It's, I mean, it's a, not to cry, it's a sign of the times and for a lot yeah. of different industries, but it is, it is a challenge to do what the community needs um, with, a, with fewer resources. Uh, but that's, that's a complaint from my boss, not for the general public. Uh, I wonder <laughs> if he might be listening. Uh, no, but, it, but it, it is far outweighed by the uh, the joy sometimes at the impact you can have on a community, you know what I mean? And even just, just physically seeing the daily newspaper, I appreciate, you know, the, the work that went into it, but from everyone, from newsroom to distribution to, you know, payroll to everything down the line, it's, it's great. It's great to see a product daily. I, I enjoy that quite a bit still just yeah. getting the physical copy. It's like the craft of an artist. Every day is different. That's part of the fun. It's a different thing every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, one last thing I want to mention too, it's, it's, it's sad but funny and true, is the whole George Santos thing, is that a local paper in northern Long Island, a tiny little paper is the one that blew the story on this guy. And the other papers, the established mainstream monsters, were so busy with the bigger fights going on that they kind of let this guy slip through under the radar. And his story is still evolving. And it's just an amazing example of local journalism catching this finger in the dike of corruption. And uh, that's an example. But I really hope that we're doing this series, really, is to help anybody watching us here on YouTube, on the WILI uh, channel, or on the radio here at WILI or WECS. Think about your relationship to your local paper. Every little one of you can add up to make a difference. And when things are really big, the little pieces make the big ones fit. And that's just your subscription or, or going online if paper's available. So I want to thank again Neil Ostrout, Todd Charlin, and Matt Dwyer for being here, sharing the spirit of your work. And hopefully we can get some other people from your groups to join us in the months ahead. And we'll continue to share the story. Okay. Before we go, I want to mention next week we're going to have two guests. Richard White is going to be back from the Ashford Arts Council. He was just declared one of the uh, arts heroes in Connecticut by the Office of the Arts. So he'll be here next week to talk about his work in Ashford. And we also have the gallery coordinator from uh, the new mill at the Eastern Connecticut Center for History, Art, and Performance, EC Chap. The week after is a whole program about health care, and we're continuing that series we're doing with the Wyndham Regional Community Council with the outgoing and incoming CEOs of the Generations Health Center here in town talking about how the health care system in Connecticut in our region is being restructured and the impact on patients. That'll be on March 1st. So that's it for this week. I'm getting yelled at. I'll see you next week for the next edition. Thanks a lot. Take care. Keep the faith.